They're Steve. Harris, the president addressing the nation today, but also taking time out to directly address children to try to reassure them that he would do everything possible to keep them safe in their schools. He said he plans to visit the people here in Parkland to try and help heal their wounds. He called the attack, the massacre, something evil. He also framed it as a mental health issue. He did not mention gun control in his remarks. As far as the sheriff of Brown Broward County here today, he said that there are still, it is still a crime scene inside the school. There are still dead bodies inside the school being processed. He said they're going as fast as possible, but they're going to do everything right. He said all the families of the dead have been notified. There are some poignant postings on social media. Some of those victims identified by family members on social media. And over and over again, you hear the words broken by fathers, brothers, or sisters, people who survived the attack but still remain very damaged by it. Some new video also released now showing the police inside the school, smashing into classrooms, trying to protect and save as many children as possible. It certainly gives a sense of the chaos involved in the attack and its aftermath, which was coupled with a fire alarm being pulled. It's understandable how that shooter was able to escape and be on the loose for at least an hour after that. We are learning more about the suspect, Nicholas Cruz, 19 years old, an orphan who lost his mother just three months ago. Some disturbing pictures on his social media profile. Uh, local law enforcement here says the profile overall is extremely disturbing with a number of shots of Cruz with guns and with knives. He makes his first court appearance this afternoon, 2 p.m. He is currently charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder. Harris, back to you. Steve, thank you very much. Let's bring it out to the couch. Buck Sexton, former CIA. Uh, you know, we talk about a lot of red flags missed. I, I want to know how the issue of mental il illness is talked about at high levels of protecting the nation. Well, it's very difficult because you have to deal with the laws as they are right now. And unless a court adjudicates somebody to be mentally incompetent, to uh, be unstable, the background check system won't necessarily do much in preventing them from getting a weapon. Um, I would just note that at this point, I don't think we're looking at a situation where there were uh, where red flags were missed. People saw the red flags. This was system failure despite at various points in that system it being quite clear that Nicholas Cruz was dangerous, most likely, certainly unstable, and certainly a person who needed additional attention. And people did raise it to the FBI. The school authorities were aware. So at the various points where you would expect action to be taken, they did what it seemed was, was in their power to do, whether we're talking about law enforcement, friends and family, the school, and it wasn't enough to prevent the tragedy. I think that's why this is so frustrating right now. You know, Kennedy, um, and that's an, an interesting point. It isn't that the red flags are missed, but, but but by that, I, I mean, if you put them all together, how many red flags does it take to trigger the system? If, if you, are there certain red flags that trigger it more than others? I mean, it's time to have these conversations yeah, if, if now. You've, if you've got the school telling teachers, uh, make sure you don't let this kid on campus, particularly with a backpack, and you have students who joke about the fact that, that this person is so mentally unstable that there's a high probability he's come, going to come shoot up the school. When you have the shooter who posts on YouTube, I'm going to be a professional school shooter. And so Someone who sees that video uh, alerts the FBI when you have local law enforcement, when you have the school, when you have the feds and everyone knows, you know, you have to wonder what else do we have to do? Buck's right. A background check wouldn't have done this, wouldn't have done anything about this kid. And it's not appropriate to have conversations about prohibition. We have to talk about violent tendencies and mental illness, identifying that and treating it before it manifests so horrifically. All right, we have an opportunity right now, Trish and Lisa. We will continue the conversation in a few moments. Uh, let's bring in now the mayor of Parkland, Florida, Christine Hunchofsky. Uh, to say that this is a tough day is such an understatement, but you are moving towards some answers now. Can you give us the latest? Yeah, so the latest was the update we got from our Broward Sheriff um, that the families have been notified about their loved ones. And um, this is still an active uh, crime scene, and they are doing their best to make sure they have all the evidence they need. This does not happen in a vacuum. You're in a state where we know that we have seen uh, more recently other mass shootings. I'm wondering community-wide what you're feeling from wider Florida and beyond. Um, 
so our feeling in the community is, uh, you might not know, Parkland is in the northwest corner of Broward County. We're a little city, um, very community-oriented, fam very family-oriented. Um, people here volunteer for many different organizations. When Hurricane Irma hit and people here got electricity, the first thing they said is, what else can we do? Where else can we go to give help? To help? And so for us to have this experience is extremely devastating and shocking and it just shows that something like this can happen anywhere. One of the things that the sheriff brought up at his last briefing was the fact that they are concerned about uh, reports of copycat acts and, and that they are going to now respond in full fashion, not just take these as a prank or a hoax. And those people who actually are pulling those things off uh, ex as hoaxes will be charged. Uh, what are you hearing from local law enforcement about that situation and what are you telling your community? Yeah, we're telling our community, if you see something, say something. Um, often, sometimes we get so busy with our own lives, we see something and say, well, it's not really that important, or maybe it's not that, you know, doesn't affect us or won't amount to anything. And I think now this is just bringing more attention to that we have to pay attention. And if we see something, that's what the police are there for. We need to say something and take these things seriously. The worst that can happen is we made a mistake. Hmm. Um, yeah. You know, Mayor, I, I'm wondering, too, because you you had, obviously, heroes among those teachers and staff, but you also had some law enforcement on the premises, too. And what the conversations yes. have been like for protecting schools in your area. You say you're a small community, yet you had that presence. Yes. Um, so uh, the city we live in, Parkland, uh, safety is a priority of ours. We're actually one of the safest cities in the U.S., and um, along with the Broward County Schools and city funding, we make sure that we have a school resource deputy officer at every campus. And the reason we have that isn't just safety. These officers develop relationships with these students and bond with them so that if the students uh, uh, maybe don't want to say anything at home, they have a safe person to speak to at school. What is being talked about in terms of mental illness or mental health within your school systems right now? Because this is a focal point. We know that this uh, young man had a history. Yes, that's something that's being talked about right now among our Broward County School Board and the school system. Right here for me as the mayor right now, um, I'm focusing on the people who are picking up their children from the morgue today. Um, and I'm trying to make sure that those who've been affected in our community are getting the services they need to be able to get through this situation. You mentioned uh, the sheriff had talked about identifying the 17 young ones who have left us and others as well, uh, including the assistant football coach who was shielding others and protecting them and, and being there for those families. Uh, you know, we learn from others as they go through grief. And as you describe being at the morgue, our prayers are with you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wow. Let's go to the Senate floor now. Florida Senator Marco Rubio is speaking. Let's watch live together. Yesterday, and because it's happened so often, people from across the political spectrum are arguing there's got to be something we can do. You have to be able to do something. And I agree with that sentiment. I understand it. And I would add, though, that if we do something, it should be something that works. And the struggle up to this point has been that most of the proposals that have been offered would not have prevented not just yesterday's tragedy, but any of those in recent history. And I'm going to say now what I'm going to really emphasize at the end, just because these proposals would not have prevented these does not mean that we therefore just raise our hands and say, therefore, there's nothing that we can do. It is a tough issue because it is part of the reason why it is so hard to prevent these is because if someone decides that they are going to take it upon themselves to kill people, whether it's a political assassination of one person or the mass killing of many, if one person decides to do it and they're committed to that task, it is a very difficult thing to stop. But that, again, does not mean that we should not try to prevent as many of them as we can. 
Perhaps the answer on how to prevent them begins by asking ourselves, what do these things have in common? They have two things in common. The first is that every single one of them was premeditated and planned. None of these shootings were an act of passion where someone got up in the morning, was upset, and decided to do something out of rage. They all involved careful planning and premeditation. They deliberately took steps to get the guns, the weapons, the ammunition that they needed. In many cases, they carefully studied the outline of the target which they were going to go after. They specifically planned soft targets. There's evidence of that in this case. And they planned to maximize the loss of life. They acquired the weapon that they needed and they used tactics that they needed to kill as many people as they could. By the way, because of that premeditation and planning is one of the reasons why these laws that have been proposed wouldn't have prevented them. Because when someone is planning and premeditating an attack, they will figure out a way to evade those laws or quite frankly, to comply with them in order to get around it. That may be an argument for new laws of a different kind, but it's what makes it hard, though not impossible. The second thing they have in common is that almost all of these attacks were preceded by clear signs of what was to come. A cursory review this morning of just a handful of the recent cases points that out. We are all familiar with the loss of life of over 20 people at a Texas church not long ago. And this is a case of a killer whose wife said that he tried to kill her. An individual who was arrested and convicted for domestic violence, which was unfortunately never reported to the background check system. An individual who escaped a mental health facility, who was caught sneaking guns onto an Air Force base while on active duty, who was discharged from the military for bad conduct, who had social media posts that bragged about buying dogs to shoot them and actually expressed admiration for the South Carolina killer in that church killing a few years ago. An individual who was actually charged with animal mistreatment just a few years earlier. In Sandy Hook, we know that the killer had a spreadsheet with details of the previous school shootings. It was also an individual whose mental state was rapidly deteriorating to the point where they spoke to no one but his mother, who he ultimately killed before carrying out that horrific massacre but someone who was isolated in the room all day, largely playing video games. In the Pulse attack, which was precipitated and, and, and inspired by an adherence to a jihadist ideology, as Senator Nelson's already pointed out, this individual not once but twice had been on the radar screen of the FBI and both times had been cleared. They interviewed him, they asked him questions. He didn't meet the standard for staying on the list and he came off. We are still learning facts about yesterday's killer. Unlike these others, we may learn more because he was apprehended alive and authorities have had an opportunity to question him and that will continue. But here's what we know. We know that he was expelled from school for behavior that often that the administrators thought was dangerous. We know that from press accounts now, both teachers and students did not act surprised that he was the assailant. In fact, many of them said that there was a running joke, obviously not a joke anymore, that one day he would do something like this. We know that the media and others have discovered social media posts, which are in hindsight deeply disturbing as they point to an admirable glorification of gun violence and murder and animal cruelty even apparently. We saw reports this morning of a post on YouTube a year ago where he posted that he wanted to be a school shooter. This was alerted to the FBI who had followed up, by the way, in an interview with that person who alerted them. They all have this premeditation in common, and we sit here in hindsight and see all of these little points and say, taken together, those are warning signs. The problem is they're not taken together because the people who might have known about him being expelled may not have known about the social media posts. And the people who knew about the social media posts may not have known about what he wrote on YouTube. And the people who knew about the YouTube may not have known about the fact that the police have been called several times for different reasons and, and so forth. And so, hence the challenge for why it's so hard to find something that works. And there are a lot of proposals. And I'll share the ones because I've heard them before and I hear them today and I'm not diminishing them. 
I don't want this to be taken as because it won't work, I don't even want to hear your argument. I understand, I really do. You read in the newspaper that they used a certain kind of gun and therefore let's make it harder to get those kinds of guns. I don't have some sort of de facto religious objection to that or some ideological commitment to that per se. We're, there's all kinds of guns that are outlawed and weaponry that's outlawed and or a special category. The problem is we, we did that once and it didn't work for a lot of reasons. One of them is there's already millions of these in the street. And there, those things, they last a hundred years. And so you could pass a law that makes it hard to get this kind of gun in a new condition. But you're going to struggle to keep it out of the hands of someone who's decided that's what they want to use because there's so many of them out there already that would be grandfathered in. You can do a background check. The truth is, in almost all these cases I cited, the individual either erroneously passed a background check or would have passed it or did. It, again, uh, even if they couldn't pass the background check, then they could go, the, they could buy them the way MS-13 does and other gangs and other street elements do from the black market. Again, not because Senator Marco Rubio of Florida touching on, as he speaks, uh, the renewed gun control debate on Capitol Hill among some of his other comments there we were watching live from the Senate floor. Uh, a former student, as you know, allegedly walked into a Florida high school and opened fire. It was Ash Wednesday. You can see that picture of devastated parents, one woman wearing a cross of ashes on her forehead to mark the day. In Washington, Democratic Senator Chris Murphy said Congress must act now. This happens nowhere else other than the United States of America. This epidemic of mass slaughter, this scourge of school shooting after school shooting, it only happens here not because of coincidence, not because of bad luck, but as a consequence of our inaction. We are responsible. Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas, whose own state that was rocked by a mass shooting in a church in November, you'll recall, reacted to those calls for more gun control this way. The reaction of Democrats to any tragedy is to try to politicize it. So they immediately start start calling that we've got to take away the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. That, that, that's, that's not the right answer. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you in Sutherland Springs, I was there the day after the shooting. And I, I was in that sanctuary that, that uh, was covered with, with bullet holes and blood and, and, and was the most horrific thing I've ever seen in my life. And, and when I was at the hospital with the victims, with the victims' families, over and over again what they said to me in Texas, they said gun control is not the answer here. Hmm. Mike Emanuel is live for us on Capitol Hill with the latest there. Mike, we were just watching Senator Marco Rubio from the Senate floor. Uh, lawmakers talking about this in depth today. Harris, no question about it. The Senate observed a moment of silence at the top of the hour and honor those victims in Parkland, Florida. Across the Capitol on the House side, the speaker reacted like a father a short time ago. There are a lot of worries that come with being a parent of teenagers. We, we've got three of them. Um, but this is, this is the nightmare. This is pure evil. His counterpart, the House Democratic leader, called this a time for action. I'd rather pass gun safety legislation than win the election because people die from this. His political survival is more important than that. Nobody's. The attack in Parkland, Florida has led to a familiar conversation about gun control, addressing mental health, and trying to figure out what can be done from a legislative perspective to prevent future attacks. One Senate Democrat suggested showing lawmakers graphic photos of the victims could lead to a more motivated Congress. When you see the effect of this extreme violence on a human body, and especially the body of a child, maybe it will shock some people into understanding this cannot be a political issue. We have to be practical. I support the Second Amendment, but we have to have, we have, to have smart gun safety laws. President Trump's initial reaction to the tragedy was saying his prayers and condolences to the victims of this terrible Florida shooting. The president said no child, teacher, or anyone should ever feel unsafe in an American school. 
To that, Massachusetts Democrat Congressman Seth Moulton tweeted, I agree with every word at real Donald Trump said here. I invite him to get off his ass and join me in trying to do something about it. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee is focused on the mental health components of these vicious attacks. We have not done a very good job of making sure that people that have mental reasons for not being able to handle a gun, getting their name in the FBI files, and we need to concentrate on that. Speaker Ryan warned against a knee-jerk reaction to this incident before all the facts are known, but some here on Capitol Hill are worried that because it is a difficult issue, Congress will do nothing again. Oh. Harris? Oh, wow. You know, just hearing you say that, um, people know that that will resonate with them, and they'll say, yeah, they believe that. Mike Emanuel, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, yeah, they, they have those low approval ratings for a reason, don't they, Kennedy? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I want to ask you something and, and have a real conversation about gun control. Since they're having it on Capitol Hill, let's do it here. Not everybody agrees on whether you should be able to buy an AR-15, not even on this couch. Where do you sit? Well, I, I tend to be a very pro Second Amendment, and I think if you take guns away from good people, there are so many guns that they will proliferate in the hands of bad people. And, uh, you know, it, it's such a short sighted discussion when we only talk about guns. Because you can take a gun away from someone, you can take guns away from all sorts of people, you can have increased background checks, but you have not at all addressed the crazy. And when Chris Murphy stands up there and says this th doesn't happen in other countries, oh, it does. You know, what do you tell the families of 90 plus? Uh, people who were killed in a bombing in Kabul. You know, what about parts of the Middle East where human life is, uh, you know, it, it is so cast aside and, and there is no sanctity there and it is so easy to murder and take lives. It's not only in this country and abstracting guns from the entire picture is not only disingenuous, it becomes very dangerous. So separate, if you will, for me, we're not talking about necessarily taking away guns, but this particular gun, because it's been showing up at crime scenes. Can I, but uh, the, I just want to speak to the AR-15 really quickly. It's, it's owned by millions of people across the country. It's a semi-automatic rifle. It has some cosmetic features that people associate with military weapons, but it is not, in fact, a weapon that the military would be carrying. It's not fully automatic. And so that's why when people talk about banning this, a vast majority of the violence occurs because of handguns. That's true, by the way, of the worst school shooting of all time. AR-15s, rifles in general, are a tiny fraction of overall gun violence. So the ban would just be nonsensical from the Can I, So, Kennedy, you, you say you're in favor of keeping it on the market, the AR-15. I don't want to misquote you. I, I don't think we should have knee jerk bans because it doesn't do anything to address gun violence. You can kill someone with a revolver. There are other ways of modifying weapons to make them just as effective. So we have to be very careful about that. It's not going to make us safer. Well, I also think we need to look at I had friends that were going to Virginia Tech at the time of the shooting there. The shooter used two handguns to kill 32 people. You go back since Columbine, we've seen 15 out of the 20 worst mass shootings have happened since then. Meanwhile, gun crimes at large are going down. So what are the drivers behind all of these individuals wanting to commit such evil acts? And I think you can take it regardless of what gun, what tool they choose to use to commit their heinous acts. What are the underlying issues there? What societal problems do we have right now uh, driving people to commit these sort of crimes? Mental health issues behind it as well. So I think there's deeper seated issues here than what weapon they choose to use to commit conflict uh, heinous crimes against you know, innocent individuals. You know, uh, today we're talking a lot about mental illness mm -hmm. and, and what the precursors could have been uh, for perhaps this person not being able to buy a gun. What are your thoughts, Trish? Well, I mean, I, I think that that is the root of the problem here. Uh, we have, unfortunately, too many unstable people, crazy people, with the ability to access these deadly weapons. And, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a weapon or whether it's a, I mean, a truck. You can kill people by running them over with a truck, and we've certainly seen that. The answer is we need to get a lot tougher as a society with recognizing mental illness and doing something about it so that these people are not out there able to inflict this kind of harm on the rest of the population. Now, that's not always so popular, right? Because you should be able to, in freedom of speech, you should be able to say whatever you want. But when a guy is talking about how he wants 
to become a school shooter and he wants to kill members of law enforcement. Those should be the red flags to put some kind of process in place to say, listen, maybe this guy belongs in a psychiatric ward where he will not do this kind of harm yeah, to Americans. You're, you're right, though. That's a tough conversation to have because some would push against that and say, well, does it impinge on freedom? It's so important that we have it, though. And maybe the government can't always keep you safe. All right, we'll move on. Uh, we will continue to await that update now from the sheriff. There are big questions on whether authorities dropped the ball on any of this. Amid reports the FBI was warned about the suspect before yesterday's attack, just exactly what Trish was talking about, after an online post hinted at a shooting like yesterday's. More on that part of our coverage. And President Trump earlier addressed a grieving nation. Amid criticism from some in the mainstream media over his initial response to the massacre yesterday. We'll talk about whether the president sent the right message. Stay close. To every parent, you owe it to every one of those kids crying outside their school yesterday and all those who never made it out of that school. That was Attorney General Jeff Sessions earlier addressing the Florida school massacre amid questions on whether authorities knew the suspect was a danger prior to the attack. The FBI has confirmed they did receive a tip last year from a YouTube user on a chilling post under the same name as the alleged shooter Nicholas Cruz alluding to the school shooting we saw yesterday. The suspect also posted several photos of weapons on his Instagram account. Here's an FBI official earlier. In 2017, the FBI received information about a comment made on a YouTube channel. The comment simply said, I'm going to be a professional school shooter. No other information was included with that comment, which would indicate a time, location, or the true identity of the person who made the comment. The FBI conducted database reviews, checks, but was, un was unable to further identify the person who actually made the comment. Who I got a lot of questions there. We are joined by Bill Gavin, <laughs> former assistant director of the FBI here in New York, a man who had a big job for a lot of years, a former chief executive for the FBI in New York, Miami, and Denver. Uh, you know, my problem with this is that they did know who he was, because otherwise they wouldn't have known about the YouTube video that they were looking at. What did that just pop up like out of the blue? No. Well, the bottom line is, I think that the individual that brought the YouTube posting to the attention of the bureau was uh, somebody in Mississippi, as I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, when they went back to this individual, they, as as the SAC down there in Miami just said, they were unable to identify the individual who who originally made that posting. I don't know any more than what the SAC has said, but it's it's the, the dots were connected actually, Harris, subsequent to the incident. That's truly unfortunate but when the incident occurred i'm sure it triggered in the mind of somebody uh, uh in mississippi that took the original complaint from the from the uh, bail bondsman there uh that uh, uh this could be related and then it went backwards to the uh, to the shooter so are there just so many people out there who have dots connected that we can't possibly know who's going to pop up and who won't Absolutely, and, and it, it is a very, you know, the line of demarcation between freedom of speech and civil liberties and, and actually something that the FBI can sink their teeth into and investigate is a blurry, wavy line, and it's not always easy to determine what you can do and what you uh, can't do. But you're right, the dots are sometimes scattered all over the place, and there is no way to connect them until another dot comes into, it, it's, it's like something uh, that occurs in all of our lives. Somebody will say something to you and, it, and you don't know what it means and two days later some, something else is said and you connect those dots. That's what happens in real life and that's what happens in, in the world of law enforcement. And it's uh, you, you know what else is happening Harrison, in real life? These kids, excuse me for just breaking in here, but these sure, kids at the no school, problem. they had done all that dot connecting because it was already done as you pointed out. And they already knew that there was somebody who couldn't come on campus with a backpack. OK, which uh, communicates a whole lot of things like this person is a danger. And if they're carrying anything, you don't you want to go report that the kids knew it. They were joking about the fact that this guy would probably be the next one to do whatever on the spectrum. I mean, we can't say we didn't know. I understand what you're saying, but are we maybe not listening to some of the voices that are the loudest who maybe they just happen to be young? 
that could be Harris. I, but I, I look at it like th these these kids actually absolutely knew. I don't I don't think there's any doubt about that. But how and, and in what set of circumstances? It's a multifaceted problem that's going to need a multifaceted solution. And many times we shy away from solutions in life because they're too controversial. Somewhere along the line, Harris, we have to sit down take a stand. Rudy Giuliani did that in New York. We took a very unfavorable stand about uh, minor crimes, prosecuting them so that to protect the bigger problem of the city. We need to do things like this. The kids in this school knew they had a police officer in the school. I think it's, a, it's an educational. Educators, teachers, and students need to go through some sort of a training process a vetting process and a process where somebody does something about their concerns, not just simply says, well, I've got it and I'll put it on file. You have to do something about it. And therein lies the problem uh, with uh, 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 civil liberties and whatnot. Real quickly before I let you go, those officers who were in the school, uh, do, we, do we have enough, I guess, protection on those people who are protecting our kids? Are they able to carry the kind of weaponry? Because you know this, this Miami area, this Broward County area well, because you were an FBI agent down there. Are they able to carry the kind of weapons that could respond yesterday? What, uh, sometimes it's, it's difficult to, de to decide what kind of weapon to carry. You, you don't want to have the idea in an educational institution where these kids are young, impressionable, and very smart. You don't want to have them in an armed camp. But by the same token, you need something available to the individuals in there and the training for the individuals in mm -hmm. there. And I know full well that the FBI has done multiple training exercises with law enforcement, whether it be red cell exercises or tabletop exercises, to address situations situations like this. It's, it's a horrible tragedy and to say that it's probably going to happen again is m extremely tragic to have to admit something like that. We need to do something about it and we all talk about it uh, but we don't actualize in, in uh, our, our concerns. All right, Bill Gavin, thank you very much. Uh, you probably could see while we were uh, talking just moments ago that there was video on the screen showing that people were outside. Here it is, the live picture from Parkland, Florida. I, I can tell you just from reading a few of the signs.